Hello, welcome back again to uh, my walkthrough of the Object Document Mapper Mongo Engine. This is the third and last video of the three. Now we've covered the the configuration and the initial set of the the continuous development and deployment workflow. We've continued. We've configured the um, gone through the initial setup of the uh, local work environment, the GitHub, VS Code, and Heroku, uh, the config configuration files needed for uh, Heroku. We have gone through the uh, installation configuration of the Flask Mongo engine, uh, the URI, lo uh, loading the creating the, the .env file, loading that, configuring the Heroku environment with the relevant uh, variables, the secret key, and the U Mongo URI um, for book ODM. We've gone through the uh, class, so what the class looks like. Uh, so let's just actually uh, do this. Let's close that down. Uh, so what we've done then is gone through some of the, the import, loading of environment file, instantiation of the Flask application, the secret key, uh, the Flask Mongo engine using the, the URI, so the username, password, database name, and the, obviously the name of the MongoDB Atlas instance. We've covered the uh, the class, the book, the collection class, based off of Mongo engine, with the fields, how we def define the fields, default values, and also set constraints. Covered the meta tag for auto creation of index the indexing in the background creating additional indexes that we want, we want to use as well as ordering and then gone through the uh, the read um, create uh, update and delete of a book and we could finish there we could say we're done dusted let's go home however i'd like to add a few additional components so we're going to cover the Floss Debug Toolbar and then create a search function as well as pagination because that's important. Let's say with thousands of books, we want to be able to uh, view them <laughs> in, in a decent manner, okay? So Floss Debug Toolbar is actually something, it's based on the Django Debug Toolbar and it helps understanding it helps us understand what's happening in the background how the flask micro framework works in terms of uh, the templates the uh, request variables the configuration <coughs> excuse me the the route list and so on now there is one thing that i will say though uh, for there is a sql alchemy we can actually see the sql alchemy uh, code if we've used that. There is a MongoDB panel. However, um, the three versions of the MongoDB panel, I have not been able to get either any one of them to work unless I downgrade the version of PyMongo, which I'm not prepared to do because the version of PyMongo that I'm using is the one that is uh, loaded when I install Flask-Mongo engine. So I'm afraid that to introduce potential bugs, okay? But if you feel brave enough to do that, then please go ahead. And I will happily um, uh, help you uh, configure the MongoDB panel because I, I, I know what needs to be done. However, what we need to be aware of, as been mentioned previously, is that this config tab here reveals all configuration variables in clear text. In other words, any passwords will be in clear text. The URI from the MongoDB is in clear text. Anything else of sensitive will be revealed in clear text. So it's an excellent tool to use in our local development environment, but we do not want it loaded on when running on Heroku. So what I do is I, by loading it, I set an environment variable called FDT. If FDT equals on, then I will load Flask Debug Toolbar. And this stops me from loading the Flask Debug Toolbar by mistake on the Heroku platform. Now, I may want to enable the Flask Debug Toolbar for, let's say, the Heroku review application. 
but definitely not for staging and definitely not for production. So I'll, to avoid me making that mistake, I set an environment variable called FTT in my .env file. If it's on, I will load Flask Debug Toolbar, the, de the Debug Toolbar extension. I will also set App Debug to True, and I will instantiate the Debug Toolbar extension. So this is kind of the, the, the code I use for that. So let's have a look at what that means. So in, let's uh, stop this, Control C. So what I want to do first is I need to install Flask Debug Toolbar. Pip install uh, Flask. I think this is what it is. Debug Toolbar. Yeah. Now, what I could do here is I could add it to requirements of text. Now I'm a bit paranoid. If you haven't already guessed, <laughs> so I. What I do tend to do is remove Flask Debug Toolbar from requirements.txt file. Now that's not strictly required, but if I want to, for example, use Flask Debug Toolbar in the Roku review app, then I, I need to include it um, in requirements.txt. So let's do that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the code that I had before and just go through that again, what we are actually doing. So I'm going to copy this code here that I prepared earlier, paste, and we'll do a control A, control C, and then paste it into here. Now, what has been added is that again, I set the environment variable called FTT in my .env file. If it is set to on, I will load the Flask debug toolbar extension. Okay, so we'll run from Flask underscore debug toolbar import debug toolbar extension. What I will also do is set the app debug to true. And rather than moving things down all the way down to there, what I also do here is instantiate that instance okay so I will save that we will run this again and I will click on this link option click and looks no different from four except for this here so this flask debug, debug toolbar is then um, is included in the templates so a few things here we can look at the versions of the, the Flask extensions, uh, the CPU time, we can look at HTTP headers, uh, the request variables. So for example, uh, there are no keyword arguments at the moment. The cookies variables that are set are here. And the session variable has the search uh, field, search field criteria, uh, that we, or the, the search fields that are entered right there. We haven't uh, done any get or post just yet on this. I won't click on config. We can see the template, how that's rendered. So it's using the books pagination variable. There's a global variable that I don't use, the quest variable and the session cookie. Uh, and again, SQL Alchemy, not using that. Uh, logging, if I use application logging, which I do for my milestone free project, they will end up here. And then the route list. Now this is good because this shows us which routes are uh, currently active. Obviously, the main page, add book, delete book with a book ID, edit book with a book ID, index, index.html. And you see that they also point to the endpoint that are using them. So that's good as well. Save book, update book, and the static is what's used to provide us the uh, style.css and any JavaScript files that we're using. Uh, there are no alias used and there's no redirection. Now profiler, if I turn that on by clicking on that click there and reloading the page, we can see that it gives us uh, some information. It also breaks down the calls into the various sub functions. Now most of these 
I can only guess at what they do, but in some instances they actually make uh, sense. So this is essentially what's happening in the, in the background. But the good thing with the profiler then is it gives an idea of how much time it takes to execute things. You know, are things very slow or are they good enough? Are they fast or whatever? So if I click on add book, we can see there's 3.83 milliseconds, which um, is quite good. Uh, we click on request variables. We see that nothing has changed. We click the template. We can see that um, the same global variables, the requests and session variables are there. But let's say I add a book now, and I want to call it ABC one two three D E F four five six. Um, myself published this year, and it's a decent enough book. Add book now. <coughs> sorry, what happens is it picks up on any redirects that are happening in the background. If I click on request variables, what we see then are a couple of things. Um, the session variable has uh, the same fields, but we have flashes. So the flash message, you know, the this book was saved is going to pop up in the the next HTML page. But also, you can see that the form fields that are filled in, so title, author, year, ISBN, and rating, are submitted. So I can actually see that yeah, it is working. The variables are being posted, is using the correct method, post. Uh, the variables are there and they are the correct variables. So that's why I like request variables. What I can then do is click on index HTML and we see the book was saved. I can just have a look at request variables and the session key is there, nothing else has changed. And templates, we have books pagination, global variable, request and session. So I can just follow along what's happening in the background. And the profiler says it was executed in 77.50 milliseconds, which is really good. Okay. And there we go, there's my, my book. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to um, just delete that. And again, we can see that the book is deleted. And when I do that, the book is deleted and looks good. Okay. Now, so I'm happy with that. That's Flask Debug Toolbar. And again, just to reiterate, it's really good for figuring out thing funky stuff that's happening in, uh, in our local environment but also to gain a better understanding of the Flask micro framework. In other words, what's happening in the background, what does, actually, what does it actually do? Uh, so it's quite useful. Just be aware though, that do not load it uh, when you're running it on Heroku staging, Heroku production, because anybody who has access to that page, or those pages can then see all your passwords in clear text, including the secret key. Now, one of the things I'm going to cover is pagination. So pagination is this piece here. At the moment, we only have 28 books, so it's not, not too tiresome to uh, go through the list. But let's say we have hundreds of books or thousands of books. Scrolling down a long table is a poor, a poor user experience. So we want to make sure to make it a better user experience by providing the pagination function. And as it so happens, we could, if we wanted to, create our own pagination function. In other words, do a count of the number of documents, of the books we have in our book collection, divide that by the number of books we want per page, let's say five, and then we know uh, how many pages we need uh, uh, to, create, to create this, and what we need, and then create this navigation function itself, which is fine. It's not an issue. However, Flask Mongo Engine has a built-in pagination uh, function or method. So, you know, why create our own? What we essentially do is we have to make sure, though, that we provide the next, the page, so the page number, 
and we have a default page variable of one. So the first time we hit the page, we have used page one. Then when we click on page two, page two is provided. So the paginate function we see here has the page and also the number of items per page. We can change this, which means that the books pagination uh, object or list of objects has, so we get the book collection, we get the objects from there and we paginate them. We want, let's say page one or page two or page three, at the most five items per page. And then when we render that, we provide that then to the, um, as a variable, the books pagination, but we also add page previous and page next because the default example or the example is used only has the page numbers. Now I've, I've added the right and left arrows to for the previous page and the next page, and also clarified it by adding this uh, more colorful uh, page number to know exactly what page we're on. So let's have a look at that, how that works. As everything else, I have a piece of code already made, already written. So let's do that, let's paste that. And paste that into here, V. Now, let's have a look. Okay, so for our read function in CRUD, I have added this route so that we can get the page numbers. And the variable then in our home page function is page. However, we have a default value of one for the first page. If I don't do that, my application will crash because the first time I hit that page, I'm not provided a page. I don't provide a page number. Page number. Um, the other thing is this. We also means that we've improved our um, read function. Book dot object. So get all objects. Paginate them. In other words, uh, get five items per page, and depending on what parameter we provide, page one, page two, page three are loaded. I've commented out the count because count does not work on pagination for obvious reasons. <coughs> and then when I render it, I've added these functions. Now the um, Flask Mongo engine pagination actually has a number of methods that we can use for previous and next. However, I had a few challenges uh, to get them to work consistently. Now, whether well, but that was because of my incompetence or because there is something funky with the paginate function, I don't know. So I basically created my own page previous and page next variables. Very simple, page minus one, uh, page plus one. It's as simple as that, okay? So that I can then um, click on the navigation items to go uh, next and previous. However, we're not done yet. So there is an update to index.html. I will do control A, control C, and I will go to index, and I will do a control A, control V, and save. Now, go to after pi and save that as well. Go back to index. What I'd like to do first is, I would like to go to, sorry, that's the wrong one. Flask Mongo Engine, there we go. Now Flask Mongo Engine has, as you can see, it's not a very comprehensive <laughs> document, um, but um, <clears throat> there is a piece here on the custom query set, which describes pagination, so the pagination function, what we need to do, okay? And it also has a Jinja template example. This Jinja template example will only provide us with the page number. So one, two, three, four, five, six to click on, which is fine. However, uh, as well as the ellipsis function. However, I wanted to look a little better. So what I've done is, let's have a look at the, there. A couple of things. First of all, 
there is this macro. So this macro is based on the Floss Mongo engine documentation. However, I've added the uh, previous and next navigation items. So the less than and greater than points. You can see this, those, that part here. Uh, so there we have page previous and page next. I passed on. And then this is taken from the template or from the example. So the four page impagination, uh, I drew through the pages. And what I have done though, is I've added this here. So what it does is the active page has a white text, a white number with a dark blue background, just to make it stand out. What it also then does is, so that's the macro, then it renders that macro for this page. So it says render navigation, books pagination, that's the object or the variable we provided, and for the home page. What we've also done is actually this change here for book in books pagination dot items, because we're now iterating through the pagination items. So that has to be changed as well. And what that does, with a bit of luck, we should have our pagination function. Five books per page, and here we have the pagination function. So by default, we only get the, the, the links or the numbers and the ellipses. So if I click on six, we can see the ellipses is there so that we don't have this. We have hundreds of pages that it goes on and on and on. Works well on a small screen, but I've added the uh, six, the white six on the dark blue background, as well as these here. Now I can't click on that because I'm at the end, but I can click on the previous. And then we go next. Now the reason why, uh, some of you may wonder, why have I placed the navigation and pagination functions here at the top? And the reason is that if I use a smaller device, uh, I'd have to, if I had the pagination function or the navigation down here, I would have to scroll down, click. Uh, when I'm on the next page, scroll down, click again, scroll down, click again, which to me is a poor user experience. Here, I can just use or navigate on the top. And even when I'm using these buttons, I don't have to move the mouse. And to me, that is a better user experience. Okay. So now what we've done is this is a very simple pagination function based off of the example in the Flask Mongo engine documentation. Okay. So I'm just going to do this. I will now um, Flask dash Mongo engine pa G Pagi nation for index dot HTML home page. Um, bu, 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 maybe I can spell a little bit better. N gin uh, four. Um, bu, 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 bum. Yeah, there we go. So I will then do a stage all changes. My development branch. I will commit those changes and I will push them to my GitHub repository. There we go. After a while, I'm now going to initiate another pull request. Again, I want the master branch to be the target. I want to use my commit messages to explain what I've done. There we go. And we go to Heroku. I will have a look at my pipeline. And there we go. It is, let's just refresh that properly. There we go. It's creating a Heroku review application. And all looks well. Okay. 
Now the .slug ignore file is doing its job as well, which is nice. And then it's using the runtime.txt where I provided the runtime version of Python I'm going to use, uh, requirements.txt file, and the proc file. And it should almost be done. There we go. Again, I just want to make sure that there's nothing funky in the logs. Looks good. Open application, and we can see, hey presto, our pagination function is working with a navigation, five books per page. Simple, very simple. Good, uh, happy with that. Let's go back to there. And a book ODM, I will then uh, say build run test. Now, ordinarily, I would provide a much better description of what I've done, the tests I run, and so on. But I am a bit lazy at the moment. Merge pull request, create merge commit, and there we go. So that means that when I refresh this. We're good it's killed that and it should yeah there we go so it's now moved my github development code to github master and now automatically deployed it to heroku staging application i can check the log there yep it's working away or the let's wait for that to finish There we go, almost done. Okay. Yep, built up. And again, I wanna make sure, check the log. Yep, state change starting up, build successful open up and we can see that it also has the navigation <clears throat> the pagination and navigation function and let's say <laughs> that I've done all the tests I promote to production it's copying to production I want to make sure that's all okay let's check the log and there we go open application et voila there we go with the pagination function simple so let's just close these down for a moment okay now the final feature so we're going to uh, add a search function because search is a very useful very handy thing to do and the thing is using mongo engine it is incredibly easy to create simple search functions you can also <laughs> create more advanced and complex search functions but what we're going to do is we are going to do create a search function we're going to look at how we deal with a more with pagination uh, in a more advanced setting and using a session cookie to save the search criteria. And essentially what we do is for, search, for the search function, we have a search form. We submit that search form. The values of the fields from that search form are saved to a dictionary. And that dictionary is saved to a session variable called fields. And then we then provide or call on the search results functions. We'll look at that in greater detail later on. And essentially the um, book query results, what we do first is we use a, so we have the variable book query results. We have uh, the book object. So we're getting the book collection objects and we're applying the filter method. So filter, 
This is where we can provide parameters uh, that we want to use. So title, author, uh, rating, and so on. And the way this works is that it does title and author and rating and so on. So it, it adds an and. What we also can do here, you can see I have an underscore, underscore I contains. It has um, shortcuts to regular expressions. So rather than writing a regular expression, the underscore, underscore I contains is saying, do a, use a, um, a case insensitive search. So regardless of whether it's uppercase or lowercase. Now there are a whole range of other things we do there. The GTE, so the underscore, underscore GTE is greater than or equal to. So when we, for example, search for books that have a rating of seven or above, we're saying uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? The other thing we can do is we can do an order by. So we can say that when you provide us with the results, please uh, provide them uh, with a title first in ascending order, author in ascending order secondly, and then rating in descending order. So from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, okay? And then provide those results to us again using the paginate function. Uh, this case though, I'm using seven books per page as opposed to seven, just to show you that it can be done, but rendering it in, the, in a similar way though in a, in a new form. Okay, let's have a look at this. This is gonna be interesting. So, book, <clears throat> let's close this down. Let's clean up this mess. Sorry, I'll just do that. Uh, close to the right. Let's go back to our files. Now, as I have done previously, I already have written the code. Let's do paste. Uh, control A. Control. And I see something that shouldn't be there. Uh, okay, hold on a sec. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm going to remove that because that doesn't work. And let's do Control A, Control C, go to after Pi B. Okay. Um, what We've essentially added now. So we have the search book, which renders the search book um, form. So in other words, we want to search for title and so on. When we then click the search button, it executes the save search, which takes the form fields and saves them to this dictionary called fields. We then take that dictionary fields and save it to a session cookie called fields. And I'll show you why in a sec. Then it calls as a redirect, redirect for search results, which is here. So the first time then search results, the um, pagination, so the page value, uh, default value is one. For in here, we collect the, uh, the session cookie fields and save it to the uh, new dictionary called fields. And then, <coughs> excuse me, we take each um, dictionary field and save them to a separate variable. We don't really need to do this. I could have done this in the queries, but it's, it's easier to follow this way. The other thing, and this is important to know. Now, form fields, we know when they are submitted, regardless of whether they are numbers or strings, will be submitted as strings. So say for example, the year and ISBN are on rating are integers. They need to be um, converted. And that's what this does here. However, if my form field uh, for uh, ISBN, for example, is empty, it has a value of none. So I need to do something with that. Uh, when I so I need to convert that, but I can't convert none to an integer, so it will throw an exception, a value error. So I set ISBN to zero. Same thing with with rating. 
Now, with string fields, it doesn't matter. An empty string field is, is fine. It's just empty. But an integer field isn't. Okay, so that's important to, to remember, which is why I've done that here. Now, I've just copied my the search um, function I created for my Milestone 3 project uh, without paring it down, just to give you an idea of what's happening. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so let's check in a few more things. But what we need to, to concentrate on is let's take this here. Now, I've commented out this here, but I need to explain why. I provide in my milestone object an ability to search either do a public search or a private search. A public search searches all books in the repository, except those that are marked as hidden. Uh, a private search will only search books that belong to me, which is why I have this filter here, user equals current underscore user dot username. So what it does here is it says user and title, whatever we entered in the form, and author, whatever we entered in the form, and rating greater than or equal to whatever we entered in the form, okay? And then it does an order by title first, then author in ascending order, followed by rating in descending order. So if I have several books with a, by the same same title, same author, but um, with different ratings. Now, one of the things is I could just add a paginate here, but what I do is, which we haven't shown here, is I use application logs. So I log everything to an application log. And I also here, I want to know the counts. So the number of books that have been found to do a count. That's why I, I have this paginate uh, function or method on a separate, uh, as a separate statement. But again, you recognize this from the previous one. We render the template. In this case, it's search results with the book query results with the uh, previous page and uh, next page. So that's how it works at a high level. Now let's just copy. So base HTML needs to be updated. And the reason is that I have added additional uh, navigation items. Uh, what I've added is here, search books, the navigation bar, and also to the hamburger menu. We also then need is the search book and search results. So I'll copy those and I will paste them templates before we have a look at them. I will rename that to. So this is the search book form. And this needs to be renamed to the search results. Okay, so the search book form, you see, uh, provides me with the ability to search for title, author, um, ISBN and rating. And then we have the button to find here. So that's, it's very simple. The search results looks or actually is very similar to the index.html. So the home page uh, template. And the fact it is very similar. I could actually have used that for this, but I decided to keep them separate. Okay. Now let's save app.py. And let's see what happens when we look at what it looks like. So what we can see here is we have the search book function. So this is a navigation menu. And just to prove to you that it also works in the hamburger menu, let's do it that way. There we go. So let's go back up. Now, I kept it very simple. So in my Milestone 3 project, I've, I can search uh, a few more fields, but I want to keep this simple. Let's actually, let's do this. Let's search for art and two and do search books. We should get one book. There we go, The Art of War. So our search function works. Let's do this again. And I want to show you something. Uh, art, sun, so search books. Now, if we look at the Floss debug toolbar and we look at the request variables, a couple of things here. First of all, look at the post variables. 
they are where they should be. We fill that tar title and author. So it searches for a book <coughs> where art is in the title and where the author uh, has Sun Tzu in it as well. But what it also does, and this is the interesting, is look at the session variable. Uh, title, art, author, Sun Tzu. So it saves this instance, so the search criteria. And I'll explain in a moment why. Click search results. And let's see, template. Uh, we have session cookie page pre yeah so it looks good now what why uh, do we have to do th do it this way well one of the problems is if we don't do it that way let's go back and look at the code so that gives a bit of space when we so there are three functions for this. So when we fill out the form, that's no problem. We render the form, search book, we fill in the, the fields. So title uh, containing art, uh, it's case insensitive, uh, and author, Sun Tzu, case insensitive. It provides those to this function here when I click uh, search. So in other words, it gets the forms, the fields from the form and saves them to this dictionary called fields. That dictionary in turn is saved to the session cookie fields, which I just showed you in Floss Debug Toolbar. Excuse me. And then it calls on this search results. Now, why is that? The reason is that if this function here can't save, when I run it the first time uh, without saving it, I will get the relevant search functions. But when I go to the next page, the search criteria are not saved. So it will actually do a search all books, provide me with all the books, which is not what we want. This way, I save my search criteria in the uh, session cookie called fields, or, in, or the, the, the fields uh, dictionary, sorry. And then here in my next function, I will reload it every time. So it will then get the fields We'll assign them to the variables. We'll do the relevant conversion where required. And then it will decide which search criteria to search. Now, in this simplified application, it doesn't use all of these. Uh, I just copied this directly from my Milestone Free project uh, because it, it does a few more things than, uh, than are required for this search or for this example. However, uh, Again, uh, what it does is it checks to see if I'm doing a private or public search. Now that's not included in this application, just mentioning here for you to explain what the code does. Checks to see if only ISBN has been defined or if ISBN has been defined. The reason is that if we use the ISBN, that is such a specific criteria that none of the other fields matter. So I will use only ISBN, okay? And that is shown here. And then I will paginate the results. Let's say I have several books of the same. However, the other thing I also check to see is if the form, so I have a, a, a when, I, when I, in my application, I have 32 book genres. So fiction, nonfiction, uh, historical, reference, philosophy, psychology, you name it, cooking. Uh, however, when uh, so that's part of a, a, a selection that I, that I can do, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. But what happens is, if I don't use a form genre, it's set to none. So I don't want to use that then when I do my uh, my base query set. In other words, when I do my basic search. So that's why it is not a part of that filter. However, if I am using it, it is a part of my filter. And the one thing to understand about filter, again, just to reiterate, uh, it works in an and. So title and author and rating and genre and whatever else I want to add. And then again, the underscore underscore I contains is a shortcut for a regular expression. In this case, I'm saying, please do a case insensitive search. And then the same thing there, I paginate that as well by saying I want um, seven books per page rather than five previously. And then it renders that template 
uh, with the book results and previous next page. Okay, so three for private searches and three for public searches because in my application I use user equals sorry user equals current underscore user username. So for every book that is created, the user that creates that book or adds that book, uh, the username is added to that book. So we can identify uh, whose book books or book they are or belong to. Okay. So this is the end of this application. However, I just want to, <coughs> excuse me, show you what it looks like in the Milestone 3 project. signing successfully okay now I don't think it's a little differently uh, in terms of the the way so rather than using a table I'm using these pop-outs but what I want to show you is let's go to uh, the search page search books I have title author ISBN rating and genre so genre these are loaded from a JSON file and I can search on let's say books that uh, are cooking only so there we go these are the books related to cooking so you can easily expand on what I've showed you uh, as a part of this uh, book ODM example uh, with a few uh, additional features but I just wanted to to show you that so to summarize then What we've done is we have created this simple book example with the landing page where we read the books from the repository, where we can add book using a form, where we can delete books, where we can edit books, and we can search books with search results. We've included pagination, so the ability to, uh, rather than show hundreds of thousands of books on one page, we break them down into whatever, how many books we want per page. So I use five for the index, for the read, and then I use seven for search results. So what we've done essentially then is, let's go back here, is here we're the read function with the ability to go back and forth, update a book, delete a book as well, which I won't do, add a book easily, or search books. So I could, let's see, I think I have an author, Madder, Madder Jeffrey. Yeah, there we go, Madder Jeffrey. We've talked about the Flask debug toolbar. Only use it on your local development environment. Never load it uh, unless you want to remove, you have removed the config panel. Uh, you, that's possible to do, but as a general rule, don't run it uh, on the Roku platform. What we've also covered, which I think is as an added bonus, if we look at, look at this, <clears throat> so the continuous um, development cycle, the CDD as I call it, the continuous development and deployment, we do our development on our local branch. We then uh, push that to our GitHub development branch, whatever it's called. Once we're happy with what we're doing, we do a pull, a merge pull request, which will create a Roku review application. Once one of our team members tests that application and makes sure it's okay, they approve it. Our code from our development GitHub branch is merged with the GitHub master, which in turn automatically deploys the Heroku staging we run the relevant integration tests. In other words, if we have four developers, uh, I do cr the create, my colleagues do read, update, and delete. We each work on them individually. 
they are tested uh, individually in the Roku review application. However, they are all then included in the deployment to the staging, a Heroku staging application where we can run the full integration and system test. Once all those tests are passed, we're happy, we promote that to production. And we work around and around. That means though that we have essentially four development environments, or actually we have a local application, a local development environment, one per developer. And then the Heroku review application is created once we do a merge pull request, so we can do the unit testing. And then once that's approved, our code goes from GitHub development to GitHub master, where after we've uh, provided or uploaded all our, or pushed all our functions, create, read, update, and delete, we can do a full integration and system test of those functions before we promote it to Heroku. And it's important then that we have our separate database instances so that we keep them separate. Uh, so or, or so that we don't uh, let's say if i do something here that works uh, on my development environment using this database and i use it again for heroku and it works equally well it works on the staging it works in production but let's say then when i use a separate um, production environment it may fail because i haven't tested it properly because i've used something uh, that already exists okay so this is a way of making sure that things are tested appropriately now this obviously is a little more complex than is required for a uh, Milestone 3 project, but I did it because I wanted to get my head around how it works and I could potentially work for team development. But I mentioned here as something that you may be interested to use in future. So essentially then what we've done is <clears throat> initial setup, created our CDD workflow, created a minimum viable flask. So we're using GitHub, Visual Studio Code, and Roku. We had a look at the MongoDB, the Flask Mongo Engine and Mongo Engine, where quite clearly then the, uh, because we're using Flask Mongo Engine, it handles a lot of the functionality for us. So the creation of the database, the connection, the disconnection of the database, the creation of the collections, the documents, all that kind of stuff. We do not in advance need to create our database uh, schema or a database. The cool thing here is, let's say, and that happened to me, I changed my database schema three times during my Milestone 3 project because I had to, uh, because I, I figured out better ways of doing things. All I needed to do was drop the database and then continue working my code and Flask Mongo Engine took care of everything in the, back, in the, in the background. We we'll look at creating the book class. So I just created a simple single class here with fields, we looked at the, the variables we can provide, the default values, and also some of the constraints. And then the main part, number four here, we looked at both the front end in terms of templates, as well as the application side of things with the create, read, update, and delete functions using Mongo Engine. Floss Debug Toolbar, something that you may want to use because it's good for debugging, but also for gaining insight into how the Flask micro framework works. Then we added pagination using Flask Mongo Engine. So rather than creating our own pagination function, which is fine, we can do that, not an issue. However, it's provided for us, including an example template. And then we went a bit further by creating a search function and looked at the back end then how we could use filter, order by and paginate and as well as the fact that the filter then we can, uh, when we're using the fields, uh, they, we are actually anding. So we're doing title and um, uh, author and uh, year and whatever it is we're doing. And also because the way that this works, I had to save the search criteria and I'm using the, uh, the session cookie to do that, which makes it really, really easy. There is one thing I'd like to show you actually before we finish off. Uh, just give me a sec until I find what I'm looking for. Detection, Mongo app, uh, Delbar. So I'm looking for, it's not, there it is, sorry. <clears throat> so one of the things, um, when we do the, uh, the field uh, so books.objects.field, 
these are operators we use not equal less than less than equal to greater than. so i use greater than and equal to um, and it's preceded by an underscore underscore okay and the same thing string queries so i used i contains which is a shortcut to querying with regular expressions and that's really this makes it so much easier to use um, now some of us may not have an issue using regular expressions but for anyone else it actually just makes a whole lot more sense so i just want to show you this so with that i hope that this is useful has provided you with some insights and understanding of how to use flask mongo engine and mongo engine uh, for create read update and delete and that uh, you like me find it very easy to use and i find it to be uh, so good that uh, it just helps me concentrate more on my application logic and application code and less on the details or minutiae of uh, database queries. Um, but just so we know, just a reminder that Flask Mongo Engine adds functions on top of Mongo Engine. So just to reiterate what that means, just bear with me for a second, is that Flask Mongo Engine provides certain, uh, certain features using Mongo Engine, which is the object document mapper, which makes it easier for us to work with it uh, in terms of classes and objects, and is very easy to use the statements. That in turn uses PyMongo to, uh, so use PyMongo commands to talk to the MongoDB database. And that, my dear friends, is it in a nutshell so thank you for having survived the three rather lengthy sessions and i hope they have been of value to you thank you bye bye